Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France Fencat debate. We're looking at uh, Italy's uh, fault lines. Italy's fault lines when it comes to uh, uh, both uh, the, the latest earthquakes that have struck, but also uh, political fault lines with Brussels and also domestic. We're going to talk about that now with our panel. Uh, Joram Gutgeld, member of parliament from the ruling Democratic Party, who joins us from Rome again. He's economic advisor to Prime Minister Renzi. Welcome back. Welcome back as well uh, to Marco Gombacci, who, who is in Brussels, the founder and editor of the European Post. Uh, we're with Italian journalist Augusta Conciglia here in the studio. And joining us from Como is uh, Tiziana Begin, member of the European Parliament for the Five Star Movement of Pepe Grillo. Thank you for joining us here in the France Thank Fenquette you, debate. Uh, before, the br before the break, we were talking uh, uh, about uh, how uh, at this point in time, the EU knows it needs Italy. It may give it a bit of a free pass when it comes uh, to... Uh, that uh, budget deficit. It also knows there's, knows there's a bigger battle looming. This December 4th referendum to uh, shake up institutions. Uh, and uh, I, it, it seems as though the vote is close. Marco Gombacci, what is your prediction uh, at this point in time, as we speak, obviously, on October the 27th? There's still quite a bit of time before the vote. Is that referendum going to pass? <laughs> this is a one million dollar uh, question. Uh, yeah, today there was a new poll saying that the no uh, uh, are at 51% uh, and the yes uh, are uh, 49. Uh, yes is uh, uh, what the prime minister is supporting, while no is what the opposition is supporting. Uh, but basically, what I'm thinking is this is not a referendum on the constitutional reform. This is a referendum on Renzi. Uh, everyone uh, in Italy are uh, voting according to what they are thinking uh, about uh, Renzi. Okay, so uh, set, us, set us straight on that voting, because we, we uh, mentioned... Uh, they, uh, Marco, set us straight on that because we mentioned before the break how Renzi is very popular these days among other European leaders. How are things going domestically? Hey, it's not get, it's getting worse and worse for Renzi. Uh, uh, when he decided to personalize the debate, because when he said a few months ago, he said, if I will lose the referendum, I will resign. For, because he said that because he was at the top of the popularity in Italy. While right now, the situation for the migrant crisis, uh, for the economic crisis, uh, uh, is getting worse in the popularity for Renzi. And right now, he decided uh, to withdraw his statement and saying, no, no, I will continue in any case, whatever the result will be. Uh, and, and this uh, uh, got uh, even worse the, the popularity of Renzi. Uh, uh, we have to think that uh, uh, a lot of people, the, the, the constitutional reform is very complicated to read and to understand for the Italian public opinion. Uh, and so the people are deciding, OK, I will vote yes if I like Renzi or no if I don't like him. Uh, I, I'm just telling you something very funny. There was uh, a video uh, by the Italian television La Sette, who was viral in the uh, in Internet a few days ago, where an Italian journalist was uh, interviewing some uh, uh, people in Rome and they ask, OK, what do you think about the referendum? And the, the people and the guy replied, uh, which referendum? The referendum on the 4th. But, but I, I'm not from here. And the journalist replied to the guy, but where are you from? And the guy said, I'm from Bari. Uh, it's this Italian city in the south. Just to let you know that this, that this referendum uh, is, is on one side is popular among some technicians and is not popular at all among the Italian public opinion. So Renzi has really to increase uh, uh, his campaign this uh, last month. Uh, Joram Kutgeld, uh, do you agree that uh, perhaps there were some misfirings by the prime minister at the start of the campaign? Well, he ad admitted that it was a mistake to, <clears throat> to personalize it, uh, which is why uh, he and we are all working to make sure people are informed. Obviously, everyone can decide uh, on their own whether they want the change or not, but it is important uh, that the decision, the discussion is around the content of the reform, what we are trying 
to achieving that reform and not on the government. So the government uh, will be voted on when there will be elections. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's clearly what we're working on. And I agree the last month will be, will be the critical month for the campaign, uh, particularly in this case, as there is an information gap, uh, as we just heard. And for you, we, we've heard here outside of Italy about uh, this plan to downsize the Senate, uh, which currently is, well, effectively, if, if, I've, if I'm not mistaken, almost a carbon copy of the lower house. Is that the most important piece of the reform? Well, the reform has two important pieces. One is changing the nature of the Senate, which, as you rightly said, is a carbon copy. It does exactly the same thing. It votes the same laws. Uh, <clears throat> it, it votes confidence to the government, um, and uh, which in itself doesn't make a lot of a lot of sense. No other country has this uh, uh, in Europe has this duality, the uh, duplication. Uh, moreover, it has two completely different um, electoral laws. So the majority are different, which which makes it even more complicated. So one uh, one objective of the reform is to transform the Senate, to accelerate the decision-making process, and, and, as I said, transform the, the Senate to a representation of the regions uh, more similar to the French Senate or to the German uh, Bundesrat. Uh, this, the second uh, objective of the reform is to uh, clarify uh, the role of the central government versus regions. Uh, we have 15 years ago given too much power to the region. As, as we speak, the two different regions in Italy have different environmental laws, different labor laws, different um, uh, laws regarding infrastructure. That doesn't make sense. So we want to make sure that uh, we have national laws on all of those key issues. This will reduce costs for companies, reduce, simplify the life of citizens. So those are the two objectives, simplifying the decision-making process and uh, clarify the, ro the roles of central government vis-a-vis -vis the regions. Tiziana, begin. Your movement uh, is against the referendum. What's not to like yes. in it? Well, there are a lot of things that we don't like in this uh, reform, actually. Uh, first of all, we don't uh, think that this is the, the right way to cut the cost of politics as uh, the uh, sustainable of uh, yes, uh, are constantly saying, because of uh, really few, um, a, a very little uh, uh, saving we have uh, in, with this reform, just uh, 48 uh, million euros as stated by the central uh, accounting of our state. And we can find other way to cut the cost of the politics. First of all, uh, to, uh, to cut the salary of politicians. As we discussed as just uh, and voted just uh, uh, yesterday uh, in our parliament without uh, success for sure, because this is not the real aim of uh, our government. And uh, secondly, we fear that this is a, just a way to concentrate the power for uh, it, it just in few hands. And uh, this, ref uh, this reform, together with the electoral reform called Italicum, give too much power to a minority, we, which will have uh, so many uh, power in, in, in it. This is the case also for Senate, where uh, the representative will not be voted by citizen, uh, in, but nominated by the parties. And this is something that, uh, for us, is absolutely unacceptable. All right, let me bring in Augusto Conchigli on this. Is it a power grab? Uh, uh, Sorry, this referendum, I... this uh, reform can be uh, understood in many ways. That's the problem. It's a a big issue where you can find what you want, what you like, what you don't. The, uh, the important is to, to see where, uh, where are the main lines of it. And I, maybe uh, Mrs. Tiziana could correct me, but I think the Earth Party also voted in the first uh, place uh, the reform once before it goes into a referendum. Uh, the package was, has been voted by the opposition and then they changed their mind because it became a political issue. Probably the reform could, can be done better and maybe could have been studied longer. 
but uh, there is a political uh, attitude towards everything. That is what uh, uh, Mr. Marco said. Uh, that is uh, against Renzi or for Renzi, instead of looking at really what can bring into the new Italy. Uh, Marco Gombacci, you agree that some reform is better than no reform? Uh, I think uh, that uh, I'm a bit scared because I'm thinking that if the no will win, no other prime, future Italian prime minister uh, will try to reform the constitution, uh, will try to reform the constitution. Because he, he will say, he or she will say, uh, no, if Renzi failed, uh, I don't want to fail again as a Renzi. So I think that can be a kind of a block uh, um, of this situation. Uh, uh, it's also a, a kind of a, a symbol to vote yes in this sense, because there are a very good part of the reforms, as the economic advisor mentioned before, but there are some criticism as well. Uh, and so the, the reform, uh, I, I can find a good reason to vote yes and to, go, uh, to vote no. That's why I, I will decide uh, how to vote uh, probably the night of the 3rd of December. <laughs> uh, um, one thing that I, 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 don't, I don't understand is, uh, and I, since I'm in Brussels, I'm dealing with European politics and, uh, and foreign affairs, uh, is that the new Senate will be composed by uh, a regional councillor or mayor. And uh, uh, the Senate will have the competences of uh, uh, foreign affairs and uh, European policies. And uh, I'm wondering how a part-time uh, senator, who is also the, uh, the mayor of uh, a town in Italy, will ca can decide uh, whether a city is managed uh, good uh, or not uh, in one part of his job. In another part, he will decide on the war in Syria. So th that's, that's something that I'm finding a bit... Uh, 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 and, uh, doubtful to vote uh, to vote yes. You're I'm good, Geld. You're good, Geld. You're good, Geld. Your reaction. Well, um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Senate in France and in Germany, just to give two, two important reference points, are indirect votes. They are not being voted by. Uh, directly by the citizens. Uh, I don't know exactly uh, about the, the French Senate, but certainly in the German uh, Bundesrat, the members of the, of the Senate are uh, representatives of the region, exactly as we have uh, designed it in our case. So th this, is, this is no different. Now, uh, the Senate will, uh, will be involved directly uh, in very few laws, uh, we have left uh, European treaties as, as one of them because, of course, regions have a lot, of, have a lot to do with, with Europe. Uh, there's the whole issue of European funds. A, a lot of stuff that happens is Euro in Europe is, is relevant for them, which is why we have, um, we have kept it within scope. Let me just add, just that uh, um, you, you, get, you get the perspective uh, of the, uh, if you take the, the last two years, um, less than 5% of laws in, in, um, <clears throat> that were passed through will go uh, to, uh, directly to the Senate. Uh, and in the case of European uh, treaties, frankly, the rule of uh, Parliament is to ratify uh, the, the real political work is done beforehand. It is done in Europe, in the European Parliament. So actually, the role of Parliament uh, in, in, this, in that case is relatively minor. One final question on this, Joram Gutgeld. What happened with the former Prime Minister, Mario Monti, uh, saying he was against... Uh, this reform. How do you explain that? Well, Mario Motti said it very clearly. He wasn't against the reform. He is against the uh, economic policies of the government. And um, he um, uh, decided to express <laughs> a no vote uh, on the um, constitutional reform because he was unhappy with the economic uh, policies. I think this is, this does not make a lot of sense, frankly. And I'm quite I have to say I'm somewhat surprised uh, that a person with his experience takes this attitude, but that's the attitude he has taken. Tiziana, begin. Uh, uh, I want you to, to respond to what Marco Gombacci said, which is, if uh, the no wins, as you would like, does that mean that Italy becomes unreformable for a long, long time to come thereafter, that no prime minister will dare 
to enact uh, another kind of big reform? Yes, I, I, I don't think so, actually. I think that we have uh, uh, the duty to, to have good reform for our citizen, and I think that uh, for example, if Movement Five Star could go uh, to the government, uh, we can do reform. But the difference is, is that we put the citizen at, uh, uh, as a focus of our political agenda. I don't think that this is a, a, an issue at all. All right, there's another issue which we haven't yet talked about. We've talked about the, the, in part one of our discussion about how the Italian state is going to pay for uh, so many things that need revamping in Italy with anemic growth, with, uh, 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 with the fact that it's got this big public de uh, debt, but there's also private debt, which is uh, worrying a lot of people. And that's something ever since the crisis began that Italians have been unable to shake. In fact, it's an Italian bank that holds the dubious distinction of being the worst performing big lender in Europe. We're talking about Monte de Paschi. Uh, it's lost three quarters of its share value in the past year even as the bank prepares a plan to shed one job in 10, uh, refinancing billions in bad debt, the Bank of England asking uh, large British lenders to detail their exposure uh, to banks that include uh, Bank uh, Monte de Paschi. Uh, right now, where you're sitting, Marco Gombacci in, in Brussels, uh, how bad is it for Italian banks? Are we on the cusp, because we've been hearing these warnings, on the cusp of another big banking crisis that could be sparked by Italy? Well, well uh, about the bank crisis in Italy, that's true. In Italy, uh, there are a lot of problems with the banking system, and Montepaschi is uh, showing off all this kind of problem. Uh, but I was quite surprised by the, the majority of the media, uh, the European media, speaking a lot about uh, Montepaschi di Siena. Uh, who is a, a big bank, but not one of the biggest banks, and speaking very, uh, um, very few words uh, about uh, Deutsche Bank. Right now, with the Deutsche Bank and with the uh, German banking system, we, all, we can also face uh, a kind of other banking crisis, uh, uh, um, banking system crisis. So uh, I will not concentrate only on uh, the Italian banking system crisis, but uh, also on the other European countries' uh, uh, banking system. So you don't think we're on the cusp of a, 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 of a big crisis? We, we are in the middle of the big crisis, but this is a European big crisis, and it's not only the Italian banking system crisis. At this point in time, Joram Gutgeld, what's the plan for Italy to sponge up this debt, which Italy just seems to carry around from decade to decade? And uh, at this point, it's, it seems to be crippling any hopes of, uh, of growth. Well, first of all, I think we, we just need to clarify a few things. This is not private debt. Italian private debt is actually one of the lowest in Europe. We're talking about non-performing loans that the banks uh, carry. Again, this is, not a, this is a result of seven or eight years of recessions. Um, and Italy, um, unlike other countries in Europe, have not put billions, sometimes hundreds of billions of euros into its banking systems like the Germans did, um, like other countries such as the UK, Belgium and, and the Netherlands did. Now, the Italian banking system is in fact today in a better shape both in terms of performance as well as in terms of health. Uh, profitability of banks is still low, is too low, but it's improving relative to last year. Uh, the non-performing loan has stabilized, they're starting to go down. Uh, and uh, we've reformed the banking system. Uh, we have made it possible for the small regional banks to merge. In fact, last week we had the first merger between Banco Popolare and Banca Popolare di Milano. So we are on the right track. There's a problem with Montepaschi, which represents 4% of the Italian banking system. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a large bank, but it is a small part of the banking system. Uh, Montepasti itself has been improving, uh, but the ECB has mandated that it fixes its balance sheet problem, which of course it has, um, almost overnight. Uh, and uh, one can discuss if that is a you know, good, good decision or not, but of course we have to follow with it. That's the banking authority. Uh, and the bank is working on a plan uh, to, sell, uh, to sell off part of its non-performing loans to the vehicle that was uh, created a few months ago, Atlanta, uh, and on uh, and and consequent and, uh, um, and and after that, 
raise capital uh, to shore up its balance sheet. Uh, it's working on it. We are hopeful that, that uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months, that problem will be settled. All right, uh, Tiziana, begin just very briefly because we're almost out of time. You agree? Uh, worry more about Deutsche Bank than about Italian banks? Yes, yes, I agree that also uh, Deutsche Bank has got a problem. And uh, if, uh, and overall, uh, uh, what I have to say in the, for these issues is that uh, we are very critics about the, the governance, the bank governance in uh, in Europe as well, as well in Italy, and uh, we focus a lot with the separation from uh, uh, finance and bank system. And uh, mm. we have to find a solution uh, for sure. In Italy, we, we have Montepaschi di Siena, but not, uh, not just that, because we, we saw a lot of problems also in the last month with the other bank uh, institutions like uh, Banca Etruria, for example, and the other bank of Middle Italy. And uh, the result right. was so uh, saying... uh, that citizens were uh, uh, affected by the problem and not the bank elite. And this is so a we, system that we fight. Uh, and we yes. need, you're saying yeah. we need to solve the problem at the Europe-wide level. We'll have to leave it there for now. Uh, Tiziana, begin. I no, want to no, thank you. We have, we have to, to, to solve the problem also at Italian level. At the Italian at level the, as well. Uh, Joram Gutgeld, I want to thank you for joining us from Rome. I want to thank Marco Gombacci in uh, Brussels, Augusta Consiglia as well. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. Thanks to you. Bye. And we say hello to uh, James Creedon. Hi, Francois. Uh, we heard uh, one of our panelists uh, uh, give a, a, a rousing uh, uh, cheer of support to uh, rescue workers in, in Italy. That's right. And indeed, uh, lots of images of their heroics on social media and indeed the, the general efforts um, to deal with uh, the, the consequences of the earthquake. You have uh, images that have been going up online showing uh, the, the consequences of that, uh, the buildings as they collapse near the epicenter. That's uh, Viso Usita, or Usito, Usita, rather. You have uh, the consequences also for some of uh, the heritage sites um, and also, of course, for hu human beings. Of course, the consequences have been significant. And this shows uh, the rose window of the Abbey of mm. Sant'Utizio. Uh, and that has been damaged and greater damage again visible uh, for another church uh, of San Salvatore in uh, Campi di Norcia uh, from the 12th century. So very sad, I suppose, to see those ruins crumbling, but uh, lots of people in any case uh, sending their uh, messages of, of strength and solidarity and condolences and prayers. So certain amount of uh, coverage of that on social media. Augusta was mentioning how Europe needs help, not just with the earthquake, but also in dealing with the migrants and refugees. That's right. And uh, that is also getting a certain amount of coverage online on news websites and social media, and notably Renzi's threat to veto the EU's 27 uh, budget and 2017 budget. And he said, if you build walls against immigrants, you can forget about seeing Italian money. If the immigrants don't go there, the Italian money won't go there either. And he's talking about Central European countries that have closed their borders to migrants. And so essentially it's a threat, a threat to pull the plug in terms of Italy's contribution to EU uh, funding. So uh, quite a lot of coverage uh, of that across uh, news websites such as politico.eu and I think one issue that has drawn uh, a quite amount of uh, quite an amount of attention to uh, the tensions in Italy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the huge numbers of migrants arriving there every day is the town of Gorino. Now Gorino uh, uh, basically uh, was at the centre of a media storm after 12 asylum seekers and their children were turned around by locals the two to three hundred uh, residents of Gorino basically said, we don't want you here. And the boss was turned around and sent away and it became a big story in uh, Italy this week. Uh, you had uh, uh, basically um, uh, quite a few number of papers uh, saying that this was emblematic of the broader uh, tensions. You had uh, Il Resto del Carlino, uh, one Italian paper saying, uh, quoting the interior minister saying, this is not Italy, this is not emblematic of mm. what Italy stands for. Then you had another newspaper, Libero, saying, are you kidding? This is, uh, the, these tensions are very real and this is the true Italy today which has a, a great degree of fear about this massive wave of, Im of, of, of immigration without any precedent. So this is 
the real Italy of today. In any case, I suppose it shows uh, that Matteo Renzi is under pressure to make sure that uh, he's at least having the appearance of dealing with a crisis like that with the referendum coming up. And indeed, the, he's uh, battling to win over a youth vote, which uh, even though he, he is somewhat youthful uh, and uh, certainly a fresh face in Italian politics, the youth feel very disenfranchised because of the way in which the crisis and uh, the tightening of public funds has affected uh, uh, young people. So that, I suppose, and the migrant crisis, will have, could he face a, a protest vote in this referendum? That's the big question, I think. All right. It's touch and go. Still five weeks to go before uh, that uh, December 4th referendum. Many thanks, James Creed. And I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France Fenquette debate.